to the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here. 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 to record or photograph this meeting must first notify the chair who will then inform the public from that open meeting law July 2010. Such audio or video recording may not interfere with the meeting. So, Ms. Fredette, on the public comment, we have... We haven't received any. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, reading and acceptance of minutes of November 8th, please. What's your pleasure? We'll move. Second. Okay. Um, moving forward, the committee votes on that. That's approved. Okay. No. All in favor. All in favor. All in favor. Sorry. Aye. 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 Um, so, would it be okay with the committee if we put the cost to the folks um, before the reports so that those folks won't have to stay? We need to, uh, we need we to approve the section. executive board minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make um, the motion to approve the executive board minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 To move the discussion of the Costa Rica trip. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good evening. Thank you for uh, giving us some time to uh, roll something which I think is uh, really exciting for the school. Um, Susan Harrison is our uh, new IT uh, teacher up in the related uh, department here at school, uh, actually has been involved with what uh, we're going to be discussing tonight and looking for your approval in regards to uh, some student travel uh, to the school district. So I just want to say that before we get into this, I'm going to let her do most of the talk because she's been involved with this. but. Um, what we're about to present to you, I think, is a great opportunity for our students here at Great and Bedford Oak Tech. I know that um, my daughter, <coughs> Faith Shepherd, uh, was involved with People of People, which is very similar to this particular program here, and had the opportunity to travel for two weeks through Australia and New Zealand when she was in high school, and really profoundly impacted her ways of thinking at that time with regards to uh, world events and people, uh, you know, around the world, and we're hoping maybe instill some of those same things here with this particular program that uh, Susan is going to lead you through with a PowerPoint. We've got some information that we've handed out to you and we've got a few more, more slides. Yeah. Yeah, there we've got them. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, so I'm not going to keep uh, too much time. You just let me jump right into it, Susan. And right. again, just welcome aboard. So, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Guy. Um, again, my name is Susan Harrison and I'm the new related teacher for uh, ISSN and PW, so I'm, this is my first year here, so I'm a little nervous for the time presenting in front of the community, um, ever, so super nervous again, but um, bear with me, so, um, but this is a super exciting trip, it's a fun, exciting thing to um, be able to present to you, so I'm hopeful that you will catch my excitement, not my nervousness, okay, so. Without further ado, hopefully um, it's not working. <laughs> so here we are with um, why we have chosen our incredible EF educational tour. So EF stands for Education First, which is why I have chosen to go with this type of um, tour instead of all the different types of tours that are out there. Because EF stands for Education First, and they have a lot of experience for education. They have over 55 years of experience um, 
And the reason, a couple of reasons why I've chosen education first is um, by far they're the top educational tour program out there. They're not just for high school um, students, but they're also for um, college students, and they also um, do adult tours. And they lead a lot of different um, college tours as well, and but the high school tours are top notch. They go once you step off the bus. You are nonstop going, and then when you step off the bus to get back on the flight coming home, kids are exhausted, um, but it's a life-changing trip. So the second reason that, that I've chosen EF is because I've done the trip with Plymouth North. So I have come from Plymouth North. I worked at Plymouth North for 11 years before here, went to Iceland with them, and the trip was uh, life-changing for me. And above from working with EF, I've also traveled to Italy. I've um, taken three trips to Italy with softball teams. So it, I'm not a stranger to traveling with students. So this is another reason why um, I'm excited to welcome the opportunity for our students. So getting back to EF, they have over 55 years of experience. They are staff on the ground 365 days of the year. And a huge reason why I've chosen Costa Rica for the first trip for New Bedford Vogue is because they have an office in Costa Rica. In case anything were to happen while we were over there, they have a, um, an office right in San Jose. So if anything were to happen, we have someone there to help us out. Um, they're a world leader in international education, and they are accredited just like ourselves. Um, here we go. EF supports us in so many ways. These things are by top, the top notch. So a great thing about their general liability insurance is it takes it off of us. So if anything were to happen, we have actually signed releases for um, our kids, <coughs> for ourselves, whoever goes with us. So for example, if both Guy and I go, and then so the great thing that we get to do is if we, how many, the ratio for our students is six to one. So with six students, we get to bring one staff member. So if we have 30 students that go with us, we have six teachers that go along with us. So with their um, liability insurance, we they, our liability is waived with their liability insurance. And then the great thing about their flexibility um, to change tours, they have this great peace of mind um, thing where if something were to happen or if there's unrest over in Costa Rica, way ahead of time, months ahead of time, they will let us know if something's going on in Costa Rica. They will give us a heads up and say, hey, there's something happening, we don't want you to go. So they will either give us a voucher to change our dates or and change our trip altogether. So for example, um, Plymouth North is actually going to Peru in April, and there's so much unrest in Peru right now that they actually called them just last week and they changed their trip and they're going to the, the Panama instead because of all the unrest in Peru. And the Panama trip is actually $300 more per student, and EF is covering that cost. So that is a huge peace of mind thing that EF does and they cover, which I think is amazing. And then COVID, if anything were to happen while we were over there, if a student got COVID, they cover the cost to send the student home. So I think that's another huge benefit of um, their support system. So another educational piece to um, EF is that they have personal learning guides that we can use. They can actually, students can earn high school credit. They can actually earn college credit if they wanted to earn. They have a, um, an agreement with Southern New Hampshire where kids can actually earn three college credits if they do extra work. And also it can help with college essays. So they have a whole bunch of things that they can do to help students as they prepare for college, actually get college credit, and then learning guides as we're over in Costa Rica. A couple of things that EF does 
that I think is amazing is that when students come back from a trip, their travel is a major confidence booster. So when students travel, they get endless opportunities. Like it's, it's really, honestly, life-changing. I didn't get the chance to travel when I was in high school. I didn't get the chance to travel when I was in college. I actually, the first trip I took was when I went to Iceland. So, and that was only a few years ago. And then I started going to Italy. So it's an amazing opportunity for high school students to be able to uh, go abroad. Um, it's a chance to discover new paths, literally and figuratively. Travel is a lesson to open-mindedness. It's a lifelong learning and action, and it discovers life-changing magic of new foods. It's amazing the, the type of food that we'll be able to um, be able to take part of. Uh, let's see, lost my place. Armor a few things to help us protect our investment. EF does, um, again, the peace of mind. So each traveler will get the global travel protection that is included for each one of our travelers. And then we also have um, an added protection if uh, students want to add an extra global travel protection plus, they can do an added bonus of $300. And then there is a risk-free enrollment period where um, students can enroll, and then if they decide 14 days later, up to 14 days, they don't want to um, take part of it, there is a whole little clause that they can back out. They can get 100% of their money back, and then after the 14 days, they get a certain amount back, and then after that, they get a certain amount, et cetera, et cetera. So EF will work with the students and see what they really want, but I think the best thing is when they do sign up, they get the travel protection, which is included. If, they, if the students and parents want the extra bonus, they can add that on there if they would like to. So. Now to all the, the best part of the trip, actually, our itinerary. So we'd, we would be going to Costa Rica for 10 days over February break. So kids really wouldn't be missing much school. We actually may miss a day um, of school to fly into Costa Rica, but the rest of the time it would be during February vacation. So we would, our, we would be taking our February break, but um, the kids wouldn't be missing school. So we would fly into Costa Rica. This is the best part. Not, not the coffee part, but um, for us teachers that might be the best part. Um, but we fly into Costa Rica from Logan, and we meet with our tour director. Our tour director is with us 24-7. They stay in the same hotel that we stay in, and they're there for us no matter what. They are with us nonstop. On the bus, they're our they're guide for pretty much everything that we do. Um, we, our day two, we go into San Jose, into the renal area, and then we are going to take our tour of the coffee plantation. We hike the uh, Volcano National Park. On day three, we will enjoy kayaking on Lake Arnold, I think that's how you say it. Um, visit the waterfall, participate in the cultural exchange with locals, which I'm looking forward to. And then visit the hot springs, which is another amazing thing. When I was in Iceland, we did that as well. And that was pretty sweet. Um, then we're going to travel to Mount Verde and then zip line through the Costa Rican canopy. <coughs> Excuse me. Day five, which will visit the Santa Elena Cloud Forest. And then day six, we'll travel to the Central Pacific Coast and visit the Rainforest Adventure Park. We'll ride in an aerial team above the canopies, which is pictured there. We'll also explore a natural trail, <coughs> visit a butterfly sanctuary, and a little nervous about this one, but enjoy a crocodile safari boat ride. <laughs> Day seven, we will visit um, the Manuel Antonio National Park. And this one is the Central Pacific Coast, encompasses rugged rainforests, white sand beaches, and coral reefs. It's renowned for its vast diversity of tropical plants and wildlife, and lots and lots of sloths. So that will be a fun day. Day eight, we will travel 
uh, via Sarchi to San Jose, and this is the key artisan town in Costa Rica, which I feel that it would be an amazing opportunity since uh, Vogue is an artisan school, to be able to see an artisan town in Costa Rica. We'll also um, take part of a cultural activity there. We'll also get to partake in dinner and <coughs> cultural dancing. And then day nine, we'll enjoy whitewater rafting, and day 10, we'll depart. So that is our 10-day excursion. So we'll leave. That's our time range of leaving, February 15th through February 25th. Um, EF doesn't know exactly the day of departure and the day of return. They'll, they'll uh, coordinate that between the ranges of two to three months before the tour. And our group can be, our group actually could be combined with another school if we don't get more than 15 students. But I'm hopeful that we could get at least 30 or more. So what does our, in, our itinerary include? It includes pretty much everything. It includes our round trip fare, our hotel stays, our regional meals, our tour director, our transportation, our um, expert local guides, our sightseeing, uh, and all our entrances to all our landmarks and our attractions. So our itinerary includes pretty much everything. The only thing that it doesn't include is our passports, our baggage feeds, fees. What, what we've done in the past is we usually do carry-on luggage instead of putting our bags underneath the planes. Um, tips for local guides, bus drivers and our tour director. Usually we talk about that at our parent meetings and ahead of time we'll get, it's usually about $100 for tips for our local guides and bus drivers and then snacks and meals. And I always add in um, souvenirs, because you can't go someplace without getting a few souvenirs. And then what does it, how can we make it all happen? So additional opportunities to fund our travel. They offer a global citizen scholarship, which students have to submit an application for a needs and merit based scholarship. And it's a thousand dollars. They have to submit a video of um, why they feel that they need um, this scholarship. And then each student would get a customizable <coughs> donation page, which is like a GoFundMe page that they can send out to family and friends. And then there is an early enrollment discount of $200, and the deadline is January 1st, so that's fastly approaching. And the reason why it's um, so close is because our trip isn't until next February, but it's a year away. So they try to budget so that everybody can participate. So here is our cost broken down. The total price of the trip is $3,389. And if you break it down over a monthly payment, it would be $236 a month from now until we depart. If they, if you see everything is included, hopefully we get third, I'm basing it off of 30 paying people, um, you would get a $200 discount if you enroll quickly, and then $236 a month. So I feel it's a fairly easy thing to do for students, um, $236 a month. A lot of kids buy Air Jordans that are about $200, so, um, but on the flip side, it's hard for a lot of students to come up with that money. So what we have done in the past is a lot of fundraising, okay? Um, we start right away. And what we've done, we've done chocolate sales, and we have done car washes, we have done restaurant fundraisers, we have done movie nights, we have done calendar fundraisers, we've done different types of dinners. But a lot of times, I've, we've had students that have raised all their money, and we've had students raise some of, some of the money. So it all depends on the students, and it depends on who really wants it and who really doesn't want it. So if the students are gearing and ready to go, then they'll do a lot of fundraising. If they 
don't want to do a lot of fundraising, they don't do a lot of fundraising. So it's, it's really on, on them. And it's a great opportunity and it's a ton of fun and we would welcome, welcome it here. And I think it would be a, an awesome, awesome thing for Vogue to be able to travel to Costa Rica. So thank you for your time um, and thank you for hopefully letting us go. <laughs> So just in closing, thank you very much again. We're just looking for your support and approval for this program, and we're not certainly expecting any decisions tonight, but if you do, that, that would be great because you can see the timeline with regards to discount is, is nearing, and we want to try to you know, move this as quickly as we can. So, so yes. is, is, there, is there a service learning component to this, or is it just travel? It's, it's travel, but the... All the things that we'll be doing is they'll be learning a lot of different things about rainforest and um, all, all the little things that we'll be doing. We're not necessarily going and planting trees or like, service projects that way, but all of the trips and the excursions that we're doing, are, they'll be learning a lot. Anyone else? Have you surveyed the student body to see if there is an interest? I have not. Yeah, we didn't want to do that in advance of coming before the school committee to uh, see whether or not this is something they would support before we did that. Yeah, I'd be interested to see the parent component just as a parent. You know, it's a, the, the world is scary right now, so I'm just curious, as Mr. Toomey is, of the level of interest. So there is a link that's in your packet that we provided for you that gives you more information about parents that have participated uh, in this before with their uh, sons and daughters, and also uh, a section where there's a lot of uh, comments and reviews about the uh, trips that have been uh, sponsored in the past through uh, this particular foundation. So uh, obviously you can look at those at your leisure. But uh, again, speaking as a parent, uh, organizing uh, We've taken kids uh, ourselves uh, in our neighborhoods to different places uh, out of the country before and the things that they were able to learn while they were there, it's, it certainly is a worthy experience. And again, going back to my daughter who was able to travel to Australia and New Zealand for two weeks, uh, certainly was very, very eye-opening. And there's still things that she talks about today from that experience that she had, you know, visiting uh, the Great Barrier Reef down the Gold Coast all the way back into New Zealand with all the sheep and things of that nature there that she uh, was able to interact with uh, individuals there. So again, very worthy uh, opportunity for our students and hopefully this is something we can, can do and, and move forward with in the future with. Yeah, there is a website on that brochure that you were yep. just looking at underneath. If you go on, yeah, or like this little circle right here. Yeah, oh, yeah. Front, yeah. the website is our tour information as well. <coughs> on here that we're um, you're doing a parent night? Well, I would like to do a parent night, but I have to get permission first. But that's the, the goal is to do a parent night, and then once we do the parent night, then we'll see what we have for interest. But we would need the permission first, but that was the goal, so that's why I have those flyers in there. I'm the chair. I, I'm, uh, I don't know if it's possible, but I would... For me, would like to see what what the um, interest, interest is first okay. before making that kind of decision for myself. I mean, um, we could be saying we're interested and then not have ten kids show up to, or parents that say I can afford it or I want to do it or I don't. So for me, it would be more geared towards how many students would be interested in it um, before we decide whether we want to do something. Or, or, or I think it's a great opportunity, but I also know that there's a lot of struggling families right now and people are having a hard time, so I don't know if that's going to be possible for a lot of people and where they're thinking, what they're thinking about. I think it's an awesome opportunity, but I'd like to see what the, what the interest is with the students are, you know, with the parents first. That's, I don't know. Yeah. So, uh to the chair, right? So I think I think that's possible, Mrs. Ribeiro, if the committee wants to send the, the signal um, that we hold the parent information mm -hmm. night. You know, clearly the committee has still not made a final determination, but it's gauging interest. Uh, I think that is a plausible course if that's the the wish of the committee, right? Um, that would be within your authority if that was the 
question or something for the committee to think about. Mr. Chang? Yeah, I'll support that. I, what you just said and, and also what we just said that um, I, I'm okay having them plan that meeting and, and, and reaching out and, and seeing where it's coming from and then we can make a better decision. The other thing is one question that I mean, you can never predict anything, but if something, how much is a school responsible for, let's say that there's an accident down there, student gets seriously hurt and all that, is the insurance through strictly EF or is the school also li liable? I believe because of that liability clause that they have, that EF covers it, but I will check on that. that I would like to have that before my vote would be just that if this is giving the parent permission <laughs> to make that decision for their child under the EF umbrella, then I'm going to be a lot more comfortable than say, well, Vogue Tech is also responsible for some. So if that could be found out, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that we allow Susan and our guy to have a, a, a parent night to get, an informa get information as to how, where the interest is on this before we make any decision. I'll second that. Hi. 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 Nice presentation. You weren't too nervous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Um, obviously, there are a number of folks who are worthy every month of, of being recognized. But uh, tonight, I want to uh, recognize Meg Lacasse, uh, an English teacher uh, at the school who, beyond her regular teaching duties in Skills USA, uh, just recently at our professional development uh, afternoon meeting with the teachers, um, gave a, a pretty powerful presentation to the staff around literacy uh, and the impact of literacy uh, as a result of the post pandemic. We all are aware, we've talked about this a number of times through our MCAS presentations and other things, of how students have been negatively impacted um, as a result of the COVID pandemic, not only social emotionally, but also in terms of their learning. Uh, and now the challenge before schools, all schools, is to remediate those learning gaps and to, and to try to close those gaps to get kids back on track, functioning at grade level, um, ready to graduate and become productive members of the society. And I thought Meg did a really great job this month at, at the faculty meeting, kind of articulating, showing the data points to her colleagues, which is not always the most comfortable of things to do, uh, looking at national trends, looking at vote tech trends uh, here, uh, and encouraging folks to embrace the work of trying to close literacy gaps uh, for kids. And so when staff members take pretty courageous positions in front of their colleagues, difficult positions, uh, I want to make sure that I, I use the form that I have to celebrate that. Um, and so tonight, I want to draw special attention to Meg's contribution at the, uh, at the Professional Development for Teachers, congratulate her for a job well done, and a message uh, that hopefully was well received by her colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. And on with the parent communication. Yes, in your packet uh, are the POSIF report surveys, which we continue to do what we've done all along. Uh, take the feedback, the family engagement folks are following up, these are the last two. Uh, or so possible survey reports. Uh, we are following up on complaints, concerns, questions that parents have, um, and sending those in the direction of the appropriate administrator. Mr. Watson, who needs all those? Family engagement is receiving the, the uh, reports, um, and they are following up, keeping a log of all calls, and directing them to the appropriate sources to get information. Yeah, they're making the calls. How is it? They mentioned to you their response. Are people, sometimes people don't want to hear from the schools or they're too busy. Are they getting a positive response? Do you think this is moving in the right direction to help get the answers you need? I think this is um, a piece of our communication strategy with families. I think one of the most important things that <laughs> schools can do is embrace two way communication. I think for a long time we're sending emails, emails are being followed up or not being followed up to. I think this gives a, and the, the beauty of it this year is it's much more responsive. So the survey comes in on Friday, Maciel sends it out to, the, to a bunch of us and the family engagement team early the following week, and they start making the call. So, you know, it's, I think over time, I hope over time, that as 
families begin to send in questions or comments and get an immediate call back from the appropriate staff member, that that will encourage more people to engage with the school. Uh, that's the vision. That's the plan. Um, as we talked about last year, we were getting 20% or so participation rates. We're doing better this year, but certainly not 50% participation, right? And it's like anything else. You get a lot of these emails, it's like it comes another email from the school, right? And so some of the work that we have to do uh, is about refining our message, right? So, you know, Marcel takes care of a lot of those uh, robo-blasts out there, right? But as I'm sure he would tell you, is one of the concerns we have is, you know, we don't want a robo-blast from me on Monday and Mr. Williams on Tuesday and blah, blah, because when you do that to families, they stop, right? It, it, we need to do a better job, and we're working on coordinating our message so that maybe this comes out with several other links at the same time, our paw prints <laughs> communication. Uh, sports information, drama club signups, but we want to be able to flood that information piece at one time. We're doing better than we did last year. We still have more room to grow. Uh, the possible comments are improved. We have more responses than we've had um, in the past. They've shed some light on some things that we've addressed with folks. Um, so probably too early to, to answer that question with a definitive answer, but I'm encouraged by the fact that our communication strategy is, as I think, better than it was a couple of years ago with families, and that is certainly our goal. Thank you. Any other questions? All set? Uh, Artisan report. Thank you, Williams, please. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Yes, I'm happy to present our Artisan report for December. Brings it up on the screen. We'll be talking about a number of departments, very busy November and, and December around here at Great Indian Public Health. As you know, it's like the Civic Center. We'll talk about the physical education and athletics department. So this winter season has been um, a very eventful season. You see we have a, a number of our teams uh, assembling. We had over 500 students register for sports, including over 150 for indoor track. That's, that's amazing, showing the, the amount of kids that have come out. And for the first time, we've had registration for strength and conditioning, which was added to our uh, winter athletics. I can tell you, when I go up to the gym up there, it's pretty packed. Our kids are using it. Um, as you can see, over 80 students have registered with our new strength and conditioning uh, specialist, Sam Heavey. He does an excellent job. Um, next slide. You'll see that for the first time since COVID, we had our bonfire. I hope I'm not scaling uh, some of Elijah's thunder from his report. But, uh, uh, the beauty, sorry about that. The, the beauty of this bonfire is that it was totally, it was student derived. The student council and, and a lot of the student leaders put this together and they did a great job doing that and it was a great night with, with our students um, just before uh, our Thanksgiving football game in which we won and we took the bowl against Diamond so uh, kudos to our football players our cheerleaders and our coaches and, and all the students to put together the bonfire great way to build cohesion in family here at Radio Memphis Bowl Tech um, that following weekend you know we have our annual craft fair and our Craft Fair annually raises over $15,000 for Great Invented Voc Tech scholarships that we give out every April. So this is always a great event, and you'll see that we had over 150 vendors. Um, and again, $15,000 uh, is raised for scholarships. And much respect and kudos to Ann Richard, Darius Riccio, uh, Cheryl Heber, uh, who facilitates the National Honor Society, and the volleyball team who helped coordinate and put together this epic event, the Craft Fair. Nicely done. Moving on to our ELA or English Language Arts Department. We have two new uh, teachers assistants in our ELA department. We have Alexis Medeiros. Uh, she's a graduate of Bridgewater State University with a bachelor's in, in English and secondary education. And she's also Google Educator One certified. We have Alexandra Mitchell, who is a graduate of Bridgewater State University with a bachelor's in English. And she is looking forward to gaining experience in the classroom. She is perfectly green, and she's learning so much among our ELA teachers. Also, um, give some respect to our to five English teachers, Kendra Aruda, Aaron Duby, Lisa Cozera, Megan Lacasse, Brandon LeBlanc, for putting together the annual mock MCAS testing. Um, they spent time in their professional learning communities building up these mock MCAS tests. Um, the revision to the MCAS test includes test excerpts and questions from the spring 2021 ELA MCAS test and focused on synthesizing <coughs> readings in preparation uh, and getting our students prepared for the MCAS test. So great work on behalf of the ELA department. <clears throat> I 
Academy A construction. Before I go into this section, I just want to pay a little bit of homage to outgoing uh, Academy Administrator Ted Haggerty. That is Haggerty. 31 years of service. This will be the last report that he has put together for us before he moves on to, into his retirement. January 4th is his last day. I've had the pleasure of working with him for seven years. Um, amazing man, uh, very scrupulous, very scrutinizing, and, and keeps teams on point. And I will miss him. He'll be greatly missed. Um, wonderfully, though, under his wing right now is Jeff Wildrick, who will be taking over the reins, who is just newly appointed. So I know that his department will turn over in good hands, and that's exciting. But nonetheless, some of you may have watched the presentation this weekend, Clue, in our auditorium. Our carpentry students in Academy A built that set, uh, awesome set. Um, carpentry students, they were busy creating and building the set. Um, Mr. Sean Elliott, who worked with them, uh, was contacted to create a model scaled set for the carpentry department to construct the full-size operable set for the actors. Um, you'll, you'll, if you were here, you'll notice it was very much like a Broadway setup because that wall that looks very linear opened up into multiple sets from within. Pretty awesome show, and major kudos to the kids that, um, that were acting, because it was really, really good. And today I got to watch them break down the set. They did a really good job. We'll move on to the next one. So electrical. Many of you may have seen the lighting ceremony by Mayor Mitchell. Our electrical students annually put together the lights down in Klasky Common Park. It looks beautiful, as it always does. The off-campus teachers and students from the Electrical and Carpentry Department lit up Klasky Common in New Bedford. Mr. Kearney, one of our long-time um, uh, electrical teachers, guided students with help from the City of New Bedford Department of Infrastructure with the arrangement of hanging thousands of lights along with many holiday displays. Students were trained how to use aerial lifts to hang the lights in the trees and troubleshoot lighting displays, display issues. That's my timer because I don't want to go to 15 minutes like I did last time. <laughs> I promise you I don't want to do that. Um, and with that, we're actually going to skip this slide. And it's office. Excellent work by our brand new attendance officer. This is her first year, Jen Carrero. She's really doing a, doing, doing a good job um, trying to get us on track as we go into post-COVID, bringing ourselves to some of those pre-COVID numbers where we were doing really good. At the moment, we have 97% overall attendance rate, which is, which is positive. I'm seeing, we're seeing an upward trend from the beginning of the year to now across our attendance. And you'll see that below that marks our goal, in addition, is to decrease our, um, sorry, reducing the dropout rate by 10%, increasing our overall graduation rate. So I feel like we have a really good trajectory in reaching those goals with Jen Carrero at the helm. Also, we're going to name the numerous hundreds of kids who had perfect attendance. Just kidding, but we are going to highlight them. The following students obtained perfect attendance for trimester one. We had 59 members of the senior class. We had 61 members of the junior class, 91 members of the sophomore class, and then 156 members of the freshman class. See how those numbers drop. I'm going to try and keep the excitement across the grades. That does happen. You've heard of the term senioritis, right? It starts earlier and earlier every year. Um, and you'll notice this is a beautiful uh, data set here that Jen put together for us. The numbers you just saw represent 13% of our senior class, 12% of our junior class. Happy to see the seniors are doing, doing a little better than the juniors. 16% of the sophomores and 28% of the freshman class. Again, looking to maintain that momentum that our, that our freshmen have into their, their following one of the succeeding years. So now we'll talk a little bit about the community outreach done by our Family Engagement Center. They have been working really hard, uh, <coughs> and Jen Dell doing a great job. Um, family Engagement Center run by them has been up and running for over nine months, and they've hit the ground running. Uh, family Engagement Specialists, Monica and Jen Dell, have been involved in many community events as well as engaging <coughs> with students and families. Uh, from March to, to this month, uh, or last month, November, the Family Engagement Center serviced over, over 50 students uh, in the realms of housing, mental health services, and transportation. Uh, it's been a collaborative effort with faculty and staff members who have identified students in need, and in some cases, 
has to go to, to, the, to the FEC and is required for sure for immediate assistance. Um, next slide. You'll see that uh, Veronica and Je Jendel put, coordinated a Hispanic Heritage Month door decorating contest that went that went awesome. And you'll see that these are the first, second, and third place winners here, uh, and they each got a prize. First prize, first place winners were cosmetology seniors and the juniors, and they enjoyed a taco sauce by me in Toho, which is located in New Bedford. Second place was early childhood, and third place winners were Miss Haggerty's English class, and they enjoyed pastelillos uh, from in quesitos. I think I got my Spanish right on that uh, from Lorenzo's Bakery in New Bedford. So. Great, great project here, and I hope we can grow it more next school year. Next slide represents the work that Jendell and, and Veronica have done out in our community. Uh, as you can see, they engaged, they engaged populations of parents and students at Keith Middle School, uh, Alma Del Mar, Hastings Middle School. And they also have hosted a parent cafe and they're looking to do more throughout the year. So be on the lookout for that. Also this month, and I had the, the pleasure of, of doing the opening remarks to these, we had students, uh, we, students attended digital responsibility presentations, all the students in the school, and we are actually working on our co-op students next. And that was, that training delivered by the Children's Advocacy Center across eight sessions was intended to teach stu students about safe posting safe postings on social media do's and don'ts, sexting and the different things around um, navigating the digital atmosphere and how it can have a detrimental effect on your future if you're not thoughtful about that. And so I really think it was a beneficial and, and timely presentation for our students and I was glad that I was able to, alongside uh, Mr. Pimentel, give the preamble to that because that is a major issue for our students and we can't just as adults keep our head in the sand on that. So I give Jen Dell and Veronica a lot of credit for putting that together. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Only 12 minutes. Seven and a half minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yep, so uh, the uh, Superintendent Weekly Updates, just again, these are the November letters. Same, same our first week of December as well as in there, just monthly, uh, monthly, weekly on Monday morning. I give a quick update uh, before the week starts of the events for the week so the staff is informed of what we're working on and some of the major uh, priorities. We are starting next month uh, the strategy for district improvement. You may remember last spring I presented the report on entry findings uh, that summarized the more, you know, few hundred interviews that I did with various stakeholders <coughs> upon assuming the superintendency. The next leg of that work is for us to begin to build a strategy for district improvement, which I hope to present to you uh, in the springtime. We've sent out a uh, survey to all staff members because I don't want this to be a top-down uh, or district-level team. I want to include teachers, teaching assistants, and other folks uh, on that team. So we, we did get uh, more than a dozen volunteers, which is fantastic, as well as, uh, you know, those folks that I'll require who are in the room will going to be part of that work uh, as well. Uh, we'll have a nice team of probably two dozen people that will begin to develop a strategy for district improvement to guide the work that we do here over the next three to five years. Okay, um, let's see, Mr. Gonzalez, you ready to pipe yourself a little bit? Yes, how are we doing today? Doing great. Great. Yeah, I'm glad you guys made it. So, Mr. Pius told me to speak from here because it sounds better for the stream, so I'm going to do that today. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, the first thing on my, um, my report is the school bonfire. So, I want to highlight the school bonfire. So, the night before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve, the student body <coughs> gathered at the baseball field for our Thanksgiving bonfire. About 300 students attended this event. And at the bonfire, students enjoy, enjoyed a large fire fueled by pallets, and refreshments were also sold. And all the profit from the event will be going to the class of 2023, the senior class of our school. Um, and the senior class would like to thank the student and activities department for funding this event. Um, Mr. Methier was supportive. He had the um, student activities budget. Um, they funded everything from the pallets to um, 
buy-in of the police department to um, buy in the concession. So we really want to thank them. And also a huge shout out to Mr. Matthew again and Mr. Riccio because they were, at first they were reluctant to build this because we haven't done it since before COVID and there's a lot of work that goes into it. And when I say there's a lot of work, there's a lot of work. I had a meeting with Mr. Williams and Mr. Aruda and we talked about how we have to have a site director, um, fire trust, you have to pay for the police detail, you got to place a fire, fire detail. So a lot of work went into it, but I'm grateful that um, the leaders in our school trusted us enough and um, <coughs> also thankful for Mr. Aruda too, who made it, who did all the behind the scenes work. Um, I want to highlight the class of 2024. So the junior class held a fundraiser in which they took orders to deliver Krispy Kreme donuts. And they put in the work and was able to raise over $7,000. That's a big deal. Over $7,000 of a one fundraiser. That's a big deal. But what I love is that they all came together and they put in the work. I'm so upset. I didn't order a box. I should have. I heard that they were so good. But yeah, props to them. And I actually um, got to attend one of their class um, officer meetings, and they're doing a lot of work. Their goal is to raise a lot of money since they didn't, they weren't able to their freshman year. Their goal is to raise a lot of money for their junior banquet and their prom. So we're rooting for them. Um, the talent show. So talent show will be taking place this Friday at 7 p.m. Tickets have been being sold during the school day at lunch and will be available to purchase at the door. Um, also, Mr. and Mrs. Vogue Tech signups have been launched. Um, students will sign up for that. Um, and right now, we are in the middle of Holiday Spirit Week. So each division is getting five days that consists of, green, of a green and red day, an ugly sweater day, holiday character day, crazy hat day, and holiday pajama day. And the goal of the Spirit Week is to kind of raise excitement. And, um, <coughs> honestly, so I'm going to jump ahead into my report. So we're doing a spring pepper rally. All right, we got it approved today. Mr. Matthew said, okay, we'll do it. Um, it's gonna be on March 10th, right? And um, the scene, my goal, and when I say my goal, I mean like my friend's goal, the senior class student council goal, is that we raise school spirit. Because um, we were talking at the table today, right? And it does seem that school spirit dropped since COVID hit, right? A lot of kids aren't excited to do care today. A lot of kids aren't excited to do um, go to the pepper rally. But um, honestly, I feel like we still have some school spirit in us. We still have some good days ahead of us. So we're going to kind of rush into this. We're going to um, have the spring pep rally. It's going to lead right into spring fling. It's going to be on March 10th. Mark the calendars. It's going to be a good day. Um, <laughs> and we're going to be working with Mrs. Jennifer Gaspar on this because she facilitates Mr. Voltec and uh, Mrs. Voltec. So we're excited for that. And we're going to take a different approach to this. So we had a meeting with a lot of school um, advisors and, um, not advisors, I'm sorry, administrators and faculty. We had a student council meeting last week. And I'm grateful that they came. Um, I had sent out an email to almost every administrator in the school hoping that they would come, and some of them did, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and at the meeting, we talked about having a better plan for the things that we do. Like the pep rally was cool, the bonfire was awesome, right? But it wasn't the best it could be because we didn't really have structure, we didn't have a solid team. So um, at that meeting, I think we found like that groove, I think we found that communication outlet, and um, we're planning on planning the pep rally in January. In February, we want to advertise. We want to put on social media, do some promo videos, and we'll be working with Mr. Pius on that. And then in March, that's when we can finally have it. But we want to make sure that students are aware of the event, aware of the spirit weeks that are coming up well in advance so they, they can prepare for it. Um, we also talked about the need for student officers and advisors for the class of 2026, which is a freshman class. They don't have any officers and advisors, so we'll be um, we're kind of on the recruitment for them. Um, we also talked about the idea of going on a student council member trip at the end of the year. So we plan to visit the Capitol um, towards the end of the school year and also grab Chick-fil-A on the way. So that's the plan. Um, when we get to the end of the school year, I can let y'all know how that goes. Um, oh, we've been there. Don't you worry about it. We're going to do that again, all right? And, um, I think I'm excited for this. So we'll be working with Mr. Pius in January in regards to building an organized GMBVT social media department. So I so. Um, someone came up to me, right, she's a student here, Samantha Amaral, she's a part of the media, um, media shop, right? And she said, Elijah, why do we not do anything cool with our social media? And I was like, I don't know. So she said, she proposed the idea that we should start um, building up our social media so it's interactive with students and so that people in our community see how good of a school, how special of a school that we are. Because we're a really cool school. I don't know about you, but I walk around here and I'm like, man, this is awesome. So we really want to kind of showcase that on social media. So we'll be working with Mr. Pius, and I'm grateful that he's um, willing to take this on to kind of listen to us. Because a, a lot of schools now, right, the students don't have a voice. 
But I'm glad that here we get a voice. So thank you, Mr. Pius, for just taking a chance on this. And we hope to build a great plan and structure for what our social media can look like. Um, we'll also, the Student Council will also be working with the Family Engagement Center to provide community service opportunities. Uh, Mrs. Jendel Oliveira has been a great support um, at the meeting about this, and she will be kind of helping us, aiding us, giving us um, some outlets where we can serve our community. Um, all right, enough of Student Council. Last month, we had um, the, our second Student Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I wasn't able to attend because of co-op, but the students said that there was a lot of things that were discussed. Um, one of our students, shout out to Simarillis, um, the village is a senior in visual. Um, she comes with a big report and it's really helpful because it allows our superintendent to know what's going on in the school. So shout out to her. Um, the National Honor Society also had the Honorable last month. So students from the NHS competed in the Honorable, which was hosted here at our school. So basically, if you don't know what the Honorable is, it's Jeopardy, but for high school National Honor Society students. So we hosted it here, and eight other schools came to participate. It was pretty cool. Um, we didn't take home the gold, but we did have a good experience. We were able to network with other students, and that's the whole point of things like that. Skills would say BPA to network. Um, also, Mr. Williams already highlighted them, but the Votech Theater Company, they had their winter production of Clue this past weekend. Shout out to Mrs. Maureen Morsey, who's been um, kind of ushering this. And I asked her um, on a <coughs> Sunday, because I went to the play, right? And she's been doing the Votech Theater Company. I forget the exact, I think she said 09. And um, I just wanted to shout out her because she's been, this is her legacy, right? And a lot of students are able to have a stage, right? Have a place where they can express their talents. For me, production isn't for me, acting isn't for me, but there's so many students who love that. So I, um, I'm just thankful that Mrs. Marie Morsi provides that opportunity for the students. Um, and last, last thing, the National Honor Society, we had a meeting, the officers had a meeting, and we want to plan on doing some fundraisers so that we can fund our community service trips. Um, and that's what I have for the student report. And I also want, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, but um, Mrs. Um, <laughs> we are. Did you just keep going? No one's going to jump in the way, Elijah. Come on. Stay with me. Mrs. Harrison, she talked about Pacific Coast of Rico. And something that I want to highlight is that last year we actually had a travel club that was headed by Mr. Golombowski. I'm not sure if he works here anymore. But um, he got a good amount of students. I believe there were about 72 students on that Google Classroom who were interested in taking a trip to Canada. I believe that was the destination. So there may be um, some, so coming from um, announcing that to the student body, I do expect that there's going to be a lot of feedback of students who would want to go. Uh, just to throw that out there. But thank you for um, allowing me to give my report. And I look forward to seeing how we can be a great school, how we can lead an example of preparation, passion, and perseverance for the new year. And I honestly believe that the best is just to come for the school. Okay, next on the uh, agenda for new business is vote to ratify the contract between Greater New Bedford Regional Vocational High School District and the Teamsters Union Local Number 59, included in our backup material. Second recommendation. Hi. Hi. We're going to sign, too. Yeah. You can take the vote. Do we need a roll call? You don't need a roll call. Okay. Motion passes.
Uh, next item is vote to adopt the admissions policy for the 2022 and 23 school year included in our packets, um, as well as the admissions policy for our approval. I can make a motion that we accept the admissions policy. Second. Second. All in favor? Discussion. Oh, um, just not pass the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. I've been going through a lot of talking. So I'm going to air that out here. So. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, okay, so um, any discussion? There's just one point I'd like to bring up, uh, if I may. Yeah. Uh, in the first one, under admissions, the last line. The line doesn't really make sense to me. I think it could be the word applying to rather than at grade in the best with Vogue Tech. Okay, this is applicants in grade 9 through 12. Okay, the okay. Where, where are you talking about? I'm sorry. I'll read the line. Applicants in grades 9 through, tw 9 through 12 of Greater New Bedford Regional Vocational Technical High School are evaluated using the procedures and criteria contained in this admissions policy. We could, um, we can add something in there around the application if that helps to clarify that. I mean, I, if you're here already, you're not going to be evaluated. Right. It, it's evaluating the applications, right. so we can, we can clarify that a little bit if it works with the committee before submission to the... Don't you have someone applying to all four of them? Uh, we, we generally don't have applicants for the 12th grade, but up until the 12th grade that we do. But we've left that in there from, from previous years. To, it's always an option. There's usually not seats or the ability to make up the required hours, so we don't admit in that level, but uh, just to be open to the process. Madam Chair? Yes. Good question. Uh, under this lottery system, if a student does, chooses not to come to the school, how is another student put in his place? Right. Is it through the lottery or is it through the waiting list? Yeah, I think, Dr. Mullen, if, if you may, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes, not only for the benefit of the committee, but also for the benefit of those folks that might be watching. I don't want to gloss over uh, the admissions process. So let me walk through. I mean, we don't need to read the entire document. Uh, it'll be available online as soon as it's approved by the committee and submitted to the department. But I think. For points of public interest, the priorities rest in how the, fre the freshman class will be admitted uh, next year. Uh, and so what is in front of the school committee tonight is really the culmination of months of work of the district administrative team that began this journey over the summer. Uh, we began meeting with the subcommittee appointed by this body uh, in late September. We had several sessions uh, where we carved out a policy in what I would categorize, and there were certainly guests in the room, as spirited conversations um, that articulate the various viewpoints that exist around admissions to Vogue Tech uh, inside of our communities, which I think is really healthy and really important uh, part of the process to recognize publicly. In addition to that, I've had several conversations um, with the commissioner's office and folks at the commissioner's office, as well as uh, folks during our, in our sending districts. As you know, in October, we hosted the Dartmouth Day. In November, we hosted the Fairhaven Day. And we are currently in the process of planning the New Bedford Day, which we will invite all uh, <coughs> officials from, from the city uh, into the school uh, in January and or February, at a time that we can make convenient for as many members to attend. What's in front of folks is the fact that we intend to finish uh, to fill the freshman class next year through a hybrid system that includes the first 285 seats administered through a qualified lottery. All applications that will be submitted to Greater New Bedford Vote Tech, students must have a grade of 70 or better in all of their four academic classes, not be chronically absent to school in the eyes using the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed's definition, that is 10% or more, and not have any violations according to the regulations under 37H, 37H and a half, and 38H and three quarters. The student meets those criteria, his or her name is entered into the qualified lottery, and 285 seats will be drawn. Once 285 seats have been drawn, we will administer the selective criteria for the remaining 285 seats. The selective criteria that's outlined in the packet includes a very similar system with some changes from last year. Last year, we awarded full credit to students for grades of 75 to 100. We have reduced that to 70 to 100. Any student who receives an A, 
B or C will be treated exactly the same uh, in terms of those points. There are some differentiations in the attendance piece. Uh, if you are chronically absent, you would receive zero points, but the scale ladders back. Students are given, I believe it's zero to seven absences for, the, for their um, seventh grade year, and zero to four absences uh, for full credit in their eighth grade first half of the year. So some continued changes there in order to create some disparity, uh, as well as the, uh, rec the um, 37, the discipline record in there for the final six <coughs> points. There are only three criteria that are part of the selective criteria. The subcommittee and the district's administration is recommending to the full body the elimination of the school recommendation. Uh, a thoughtful review of the recommendation piece last year, in my view, and in the view of our leadership team and the subcommittee, uh, I, I, I don't have the level of confidence that I wanted to have in awarding 26 points to that piece. Um, I, I want kids to be able to access vocational technical education here through coming to school. That is the primary piece. Uh, we need to be able to look at the region's employers, train them, get them workforce ready, and know that they're going to be able to get out there. That'll be 50 points of the selective criteria this year. Uh, 26 points will be awarded based upon the discipline record, and 24 points based upon the students' grades. A year from now, we will review both sets of data to compare student demographic profiles, IEP students, ELL students, so that we have a 50-50 comparison as to whether the admittance to the vocational technical school via the lottery, and the admittance to the vocational technical school via the selective criteria are creating the same or different demographic student profiles. Despite all of the political pressures around us, and there are plenty, and we are all feeling it inside the school, outside the school, and at the state level. We have to stay focused on the data and allow the data to drive the conversation. And believe me when I tell you, that is not always easy. No one is immune from feeling those pressures or feeling those, on those moves. And so I commend the committee. This is a difficult choice, I'm sure, for many folks. Um, but what's required for us, in my view, is what I put the pressure on myself is that we have to make difficult decisions at times um, and allow the information to guide our work. Not what we feel, not what we see, not what we think, but the information to drive us. And so I think that's a really important piece uh, for us to consider tonight and for us to talk about uh, in, an open, in an open format. And with that, uh, to Mr. Toomey's question, uh, we will administer the 285 seats via the qualified lottery. We will then proceed to fill the seats via the selective criteria. In a spirit of being fully transparent with this committee, I will tell you what I told the subcommittee. I fully expect that there will be score ties in the selective criteria. I cannot tell you how many, because I don't know what the applications will look like. In the event there is a tie, let's just say there are 125 kids with a score of 98, and there are only 88 spots left. We would administer a qualified lottery for those 125 students for those final 88 spots. If we still, after administering that, had only 562 students, we are going to admit three more students. And that might mean that there are 73 kids with a 97. We will administer another lottery to pull those three kids out so that there is equitable access for all students in the pre lottery, in the, in the qualified lottery piece, as well as the selective criteria piece. That is how we will administer that, that is until we have a full class. And we will be denoting privately, uh, those students that selected so that we can track that data as well because we have a responsibility down the road to articulate what the outcomes are for students when they graduate and where they're going and what they're doing and how that's impacting the region's workforce. And so uh, we've done that for this year. We will continue to do that over the next several years so that we can answer the questions that, quite frankly, none of us know the answers to. <coughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Sorry. All uh, right. You, you mentioned the, the 285, yep. you know, and then you said there was a tie at 98, for example, for 125, yep. take 81. If you had to have three more seats, why won't you just go with the remainder of those 98 point kids? You say that one more time. You said, for example, if you had 125 kids at 98, yep. you only had 85 slots, yep. you take their slots. Then you said, well, now we have to have three more. 
would go to 97. Yeah, no, we would take, no, no, we would take the rest of the 98s. Okay. I'm okay. assuming the 98s would all gotten in. You yes. finish that up first. No. Before, okay. Correct. So if 89 kids with 98s came out and there were still whatever that math is, right, the 35 more, we'll we would start there and pull the next three. Correct. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll just continue to move down. The, my, my point is anytime there is a tie score right. and we can't admit all of the students with the tie score, we would then go into a qualified lottery set to, to get to that point. Excellent. Some folks have asked why 285 and 285. I didn't want to pick between 283 and 282. What I can tell you from my experience is 285 and 285 equals 570. More than five kids are going to decline acceptance. Trust me. We administered over 700. We had, uh, accepted more than 700 kids last year. It is very common for a student to be accepted one way or the other. There were 65 kids administered by the lottery and three declined. Right? So kids will ultimately choose to go to the sending district. So I'm comfortable that when I say we're admitting 570, we're not going to have 570 when we get to the enrolled piece. It's going to go down uh, hopefully to 565. That's our goal. Any other questions, comments? Well, we'll yeah. So I, I think there's no, no surprise. I'm, I'm a critic of the lottery in general. And I just think that 285 is far too extreme uh, going, starting out with this you know, half. I think sometimes in order to try to fix something for one group, you make it unfair for another. And I think, you know, when a, when a parent comes to me and asks, my kid did everything right. They, they got great marks. They did attendance. You know, they, no discipline issues. But yet it hung on the balance of getting picked out of a half. That just to me just does not seem like a fair way to base somebody's education. I know when I came here, I had, to, I had to watch what I did in middle school. I had to make sure I did everything right in order to get selected to come here. And now, we've based it on picking a name out of a hat. And I just can't wrap my head around how that's fair. Um, you know, everybody says everybody deserves an opportunity to come here. And that's great. We get a 1,000 applications. But the truth of the matter is, not everybody can come here. We, we can only take 565. So, you know, are we, are we taking the incentive out of students to work hard? Are we setting them up for failure? Because now we've just, you know, like, I don't really have to try. I can get C's. I can, you know, maybe miss a few days in school. But if I get lucky and my name gets picked out of the hat, I get to come here. And to me, that's just not a fair way to do this at all. And I think doing half, again, is far too extreme. I think we're going to be surprised at the results. And this may backfire on us. I think that's just too high a number to be starting with. I'd like to agree with Wayne wholeheartedly. I, I understand where he's coming from. But we're, we're at a point right now in the real world where we're being pushed around by Big Brother. We have to do what we have to do. I would, I would hate to go to a total lottery. So if, if this would work with the 285, I'm in favor of it. Mr. Shane? I agree with Wayne. I agree with Randy. But Michael, you provide us a letter in our packet. And you can see my highlights and my you know, strong highlights, I think it was. And, and, I, and I'm reading here December 7th. And this came, this came from, I believe, Desi, right? Yeah, Desi. And Hadley says the ninth grade class reflects a possible just poor persuasion, exclusion of protected student populations, departments required. So, like, possible, it doesn't say what. And it was like a teacher saying that you possibly didn't answer all my questions, so I'm going to fail you. So, it, it, this is part of education. Then it talks about. The department may choose to intervene and may require to revise to revise your admission policy, not work with you to revise it. So the Department of Education put it in plain writing to me that if we don't go this way, what way are they going to say that we must do? And they may, may say that we think you should go 100% lottery. Or, so I, I'm not, I'm not proponent. I'm not all in with it, but I, I am voting it this way because I think, though, at least 
the internal mechanism of this school is to create a son that we're giving them that they must approve. But I think if we go, don't do that, in my opinion, that we may not have a choice to say 285. They may say, we think it should be 300, 350. So I'm supporting it because of that reason. It may not be a strong reason, because I, I agree with you, and, and being a former principal superintendent, I was 100% against it. But I'm not happy with the letter, and, and I, I, I can still read. Hmm. Read is telling me that you don't go with it, get ready. So that's what my feeling is. Sure. Now, I'll share a little bit publicly. Obviously, I've kept a lot of this to myself and out of the public eye. Um, but there are some pieces of information that we just have to talk about. The fact is there are 26 freshman EL students here. There were 35 last year. We admitted a pilot lottery. We have nine less language learners here. And so without getting into the public debate, the question becomes, why? Why? Uh, they weren't selected out of the 65, so out of the 500 seats, clearly they didn't have the highest scores in order to get in. So we want to dig into the why, right? I have some issues as well, which I've, you all know me. I'm not shy, right? It's not always a strength. Sometimes it's a weakness. I am not happy. And I'll say it out loud, they might even be watching. I don't know the demographic student makeup today of those kids on the application list. We've submitted all 1,000 kids from last year. The state knows who they are. But we rely on self-identification in that process. But all those students who came from a public institution last year were reported by their sending districts as white, black, Hispanic, Latino, ELL, IEP, or otherwise, which means the Department of Education has that information. In my response to the commissioner's December 7th letter, which is due next Wednesday, I will very clearly call that out. That on the go forward, vocational technical schools beyond this one need access to a full range of information in order to take the kind of systemic shifts that should be required. Uh, I don't have a good reason why that's the case, which is why I advocated at the subcommittee for change in policy. Because something has prevented EL students from admittance into the school. And it may be the attendance policy. It may be grading policies and pedagogical strategies at the middle school level. It may be a lot of things that I don't have the answer to today. But one of the things that we need from the state is greater access to who is actually applying. If you do not apply, you will not get in. That's start right there. So why are people not applying? We need to work on that. That's one of the reasons why we hired a DEI director and two family engagement specialists to get out into the community to articulate and share that vision with folks. But that's a joint responsibility, right? We, we share it with our sending communities and the Department of Ed to make sure that we're all in on trying to make sure that information is out there. So your point, Mr. Shea, uh, is well-founded. I don't know, based upon what you decide tonight, what the commissioner will decide. He is certainly feeling pressures from all sides of this, the same way that I will here and that you will. Uh, in the end, I think this is a reasonable approach to being able to measure what the impact of a qualified lottery would be. And I have shared that with the commissioner's team, what I'm sharing with you right now. Uh, and where I think the focal points should be for vocational technical education. Less on grades, more on attendance, and making sure that students uh, who are in the school uh, do not have a history of, we're not gonna provide blow torches and wrenches and hammers to students with a, a, a suspension for fights and things of the like. That creates a dangerous environment for other learners. So those kinds of pieces are part of the conversation. Talked about the subcommittee, we've talked about it uh, with the state as well, and we'll talk about it with anybody in the community who wants to have that conversation. Can I just wrap up with it quickly? I'm sorry, I apologize, but reading that letter, uh, uh, I believe the Department of Education is really going attacking the vocational schools in the state of Massachusetts. If they had that much interest of what we're hearing here, you're on uh, 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 top of our uh, uh, triangle here. They should have been going to the schools, at least the big schools in the state, which is not hard to do, and have a meeting with, this, with all of us talk about how we, because Wayne's input, you know, Randy's input, you, you, you can feel yeah. what they're saying. 
Well, now they just want data to go in, and then he says the possible issues, not even you have an issue. So publicly, I think they're attacking us, but I also don't want to have a contest in the sense of saying, well, then you decide everything against us. So if we can do something and go forward, that's fine. But I, but I just want that on record that I, I'm not pleased with that Department of Education going after a, what's been a very positive thing in Massachusetts is a vocational training that everybody wants more of and, and, and they're hammering us away. So I'm yeah. off my, my yeah. stool. <laughs> I don't want to belabor the point, but um, you know, Wayne and I respectfully are at both opposite ends of the spectrum. I just want to remind people publicly too: we are a public education facility. We are not a private school; we're a public school. And you know, for me, everybody has their individual personal best. And I think for students who are not A students and not accelerated learners, they they not have never good enough for a great and better vote tech. And I think there should be some leveling of the playing field for you know, kids who aren't those A students to have the opportunity, just as a student who's an A plus student, um, to come and learn a trade and support their family and you know, maybe are not college bound and this is a great opportunity for that. So um, I will not be voting in favor of this policy tonight. Madam Chair, just one final word. I too agree with what Mr. Shea and Randy have been speaking. I'm probably in my 51st or 52nd year of being associated with the school, from a student to a teacher to an advisor to a school committee member. And I've seen all kinds of things happen at the school. In 1993, when Boke Ed was considered as a school where nobody, well, they just send your kids because they can't make it anywhere else until 1993 when they changed the Education Reform Act. We were told at that time we had to bring ourselves up. Well, we did. We've improved our academics. We've gotten to the point where the school is a safety, safe environment, not safety. It's a very safe environment for school teachers to come in, students to come. Our academics are top notch. Our shops are top notch. I don't see anything it's going to be gained by going to a full lottery. I agree there's some changes that have to be made to our system to incorporate some of the people that Kim is talking about, but I don't think the lottery is the answer. I think that people should start looking around at other venues. They ought to come in. People are ac the academics of the world. They don't understand what vocational education is about. Thank you. Just one more thing to back up on the, uh, you know, the Department of Education. If, if 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 this is what they want and they're going to make threats, then let them mandate it. But I, for one, will be bullied into voting for a policy because they might do something. If they might do it, then let them do it and let it be a mandate, and then tell us what to do. And then when it fails, it'll be on them. But I'm not going to be bullied into voting for a policy just because they, you know, have threats. Might as well weigh in. <laughs> Obviously, you have three subcommittee members here who have three different views. Um, I'm going to say it like I've said it all along. I've been here, and I'll go back to MCAS, and I bring this up as a comparison. Um, when I was screaming at the state house, how do you want us to have MCAS scores that a comprehensive school has when those kids have? A whole day of academics and we only have half, but yet you want us to get the same grades, the same thing as anybody else. And you know what? I was wrong. Our scores are better than anybody else. It tells me that working with your hands, doing uh, uh, both and related, and working that way, that's a better education than a comprehensive education. And it's proved out. They're coming after us because we have a better educational system. No doubt about it. Hands-on and academics together. Put them together, you get a, it thrives. I'm, I was totally against the lottery, and like I said, I agree with the data. 
give me half and half. Prove it to me that this is how it works. Because I don't see how you pick out of a hat and get the English language learners or the kids with the C's. I don't see how that happens. The way it is set up right now, I'm very confident for myself that this is a proven, this is going to prove it out, whether it works or it doesn't work. And, I'll, and I, don't, I think that's the fair way to do it. You're taking a, a half of the kids and you're putting them in a lottery, you have a qualified lottery, let's see where it goes. Because something has to change. There are kids that are getting left out of here. And saying, and, I, and I've spoken this with my colleague, a grade of an A and a grade of a C means nothing to me. Kids that come from, a lot of kids I know, a C is their A. And that's a fact, and it's always going to be a fact. Because you have an A, doesn't make you better than a kid with a C. It's what you put into it to get to that C, or what you put into it to get to that A. So um, I'm just putting it up there. I don't want to get on a tangent here, because I. Well, we kind of need you to, because you, Wayne, and Kim were on the subcommittee. They're voting no for different reasons. So you've got a lot of, <laughs> you've got a lot of persuading to do to get this across the finish line. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> There's no harm in the, in the proof is in the pudding. That's how I put it. And there's no better way of taking the proof than having a half and half here and see where it lies. You're going to have data come down. I'd much rather see that than throwing it away and say, no, I'm not voting for this because I'm not getting my way with that. Or I think this, let's be fair to all kids. I think this is a fair way to prove to the community and, and the De Desi and whoever else is listening out there. Let's see if this works. I had these conversations with my sending my mayor, and we've had long conversations over this. You, if, how do you tell me by picking out of a hat that you're going to get more of these kids than those kids? Is that, I, I, don't want, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I think this fear, it's fear when it's 50-50, go to the qualified lottery, let's see where it goes. I think that's better than sitting here saying, no, I'm not going to do this, and then somebody else coming, oh, yeah, you're going to do this. All right? I'd rather show it. The data, prove, prove it by data. That's all I'm asking. And it doesn't have to be something that's going to be long term. Let's see where it goes. We might have a lottery, and then, you know, something that to me takes a weight off of a whole lot of stuff of those parents calling up, my kids didn't get in here. You know how many phone calls we get every year? I don't know. I know how many I get. I'd much rather have this happen where it's fair across the board, and I think it's much fairer this way because everybody's going to have an opportunity, and we're going to see what happens at the end of this. That's it. I'm off. Mr. Jurgen? Due to the importance of this question, I'd like to uh, ask for a roll call vote for this. I was going to do this. I, I already whispered that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Madam Chair, one more thing. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'll be brief. Um, I just, to that, I just don't want to see this incoming freshman class be the guinea pigs. Um, you know, to see if this fails or if it, you know, I just don't want to see them take the brunt of what could be an ugly entrance, uh, you know, admissions policy. Um, the other thing is, once they get in here, and I've talked to teachers at this school, there's no guarantee they're even going to come close to the shop that they want to do. So they may come here with something in their head that they want to be. Let's say it's a carpenter, a plumber, a, a welder, whatever. Based on their performance, they're not even going to come close to what they want. So was it all futile for them to get picked by a lottery to get into a school where they can't even get the trade that they want now? So there's no guarantee that once you're in, you're going to get the shop that you want or even close to what you want to be. So again, if we set them up for failure, <laughs> or for unrealistic goals. You know, you got in, but now you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have to be in a trade that you really don't wanna be in. So just keep that in the back of your mind as well. I don't see how that even makes a difference because kids that come in here on the regular, the regular system that we have as admissions now can come in here and wanna be a carpenter and still not get carpentry. I don't see where that makes a difference. It doesn't matter. Well, I think it does. But How does it make? Explain it to me. I want to hear it. I just think somebody comes here with goals in their in their head. Right. Everybody. And they're not even going to come close. 
they're going to end up in a shop that they would just put in. What makes you think anybody that comes in here now is getting every shop that they want? You see, well, not everybody. Six, seven, yeah. but I think some they of don't. them get pretty close to no, what they, they wanted to win. do. Not everybody does. I, well, I disagree with that. Well, I, you know, and I've talked to teachers. You know? Okay. Um, so, are you ready for a roll call on this, please? We should take a motion to approve yours. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion that we adopt the present mission policy that we have received tonight. Is there already a motion? There's already a motion. Yeah, we were going to have a discussion. Okay. Good. You have it, Mrs. Rivero. Motion and a second. Mrs. Rivero. Mrs. Mrs. Rivero. Mrs. Rivero. Okay. You can do it. Ms. Bancourt? No. Jay? Yes. Mrs. Rivero? Yes. Mrs. Oliveira? No. Mrs. Durgan? Reluctantly, yes. Mr. Toomey? Yes. Dr. Marlin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, that was a still horrible love you, love. effort. I think it was a good conversation. No, most definitely. I think it, so I just want to add one thing, if I may, Dr. Mullen. I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of the members expressing their view. I, I think this is a really important part of the public process for us, um, that people see that there is ongoing discussion, that there is debate, that we're having conversations around a very difficult topic. And so, um, I don't want to be sly to the point of uh, Ms. Betancourt or Ms. Oliveira's position because I understand what both of them are saying. Um, and I think that's really important for folks who are advocating in one way or the other to realize that there is another view and that your view likely has 30 or 40 percent behind it. And then there's the big folks in the middle, many of whom who voted yes tonight, who are reluctantly trying to figure out where that goes. Um, and I think that's symbolic of the overall uh, region. And that's why we're taking these steps to be able to, to move forward. So I just wanted to say quickly, I appreciate everybody uh, sharing their views uh, in a public format. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just through you. And I'd just like to thank my two colleagues. We had some very spirited <laughs> discussion. Yes. Um, we agree to disagree. And at the end of the day, um, yeah, I consider both of them uh, close friends and good colleagues, and I want to thank them for, for their honest uh, debate, if you will. So. I think people's passions about protecting the reputation of this school came through loud and clear, and I think we all want the same thing. Absolutely. Um, it was it was strange word, but enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> subcommittee, even though we left sometimes, like our shoulders were up in our ears because it was just such a stressful conversation. <laughs> But it was, and I appreciate that. But I, I have to say, it's, it's healthy. It's very mm -hmm. healthy. Yeah. Instead of going, it's, it's a lot of views that come out, and we all come from different backgrounds, and we all have our own personal biases and how we feel about things, so I think it's very healthy, mm -hmm. and, it, and it came out. But, uh, I, I feel like I should be having two or three birthdays a year the way this white hair is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. I'll see you'll sleep tonight. It's done. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. What's the thing? Adam, she had your problems. One question. Yes. Um, what we've done, we've just voted for a policy that still yet has to be approved by TTSA. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. No. 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 Does not need to be approved. Oh, well. They do not have approval authority. You are the approval authority. They have regulatory options to intercede. They may or may not. Uh, utilize, but uh, they do not approve this policy. This policy will be touched up with a quick word, and I, I appreciate some. I will take care of that, and by Thursday it will be submitted to the department. Uh, uh, do we have to vote on that again next meeting? This policy is no. to be voted on twice. No. 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 We're moving forward. We always had first reading, second reading of policies. We could take a vote to waive the reading of the, f the first reading if, if if you'd like to do that. Kind of considered the last review yes. of it, the first reading, and this was the final. Yeah. I think that's where we were coming from. Oh, yeah. I think that was the intent. Yeah. yeah. We've been moving towards that timeline. I'm, I'm submitting, supposed to submit on Thursday with your approval. Uh, I'm taking that tonight's vote as that piece, and uh, we'll go from there.
<laughs> Isn't tomorrow's deadline? I, I gave myself one more day. I, said, <laughs> I knew we were meeting Tuesday. I need to recover from this. I told him we'd have it in on Thursday. So they agreed to that, so that was fine. My mind won't change by January. <laughs> to transfer balances from inactive student activity accounts. Motion to approve. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, okay uh, vote <coughs> to approve the new substitute nurse pay rate. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. This is hugely needed in this community. Yes. So difficult for the nurses. Mm -hmm. yep. um, vote to designate uh, equipment as surplus. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay. Um, report on personnel appointments, retirements, resignations, etc. Um, he's listed with no vote necessary and formal. Um, school you see the place on five? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So the communication with Martin's driving school? Yep. Pam, you want to talk about it? <laughs> uh, this, I sent out an RFP to um, community for any high school that would like to conduct driver education training here at the building. Yeah. We had done this prior to COVID. Um, <coughs> COVID we had ceased uh, starting a new contract with anyone. Uh, so now that we are back in full swing, um, I did do the RFP. We had one company that did um, respond and they were the only bidder, uh, which is Martin's Driving School, who is the letter that you have today to have them receive on file for information though that will go out to them. Um, and they were also the vendor that we had here in the building for years prior to that. Okay. Um, committee discussion. Oops, I just wanted to kind of, for the committee just to loop back, um, Mr. Watson and I and Nancy from HR had a Zoom meeting with a um, group of staff who have been coming to public comment sessions pretty regularly around some leave questions that they had. We did take the time to meet with them. Um, Serge was there, representatives from the union. Heather was there, a um, few staff members. We had a nice group. It was a very good conversation. Um, different than public comment, we were able to have a nice dialogue with everybody around concerns that staff have. Um, talked about ratification of the contract and some concessions that happened through that process. Um, but I think it was a, a healthy dialogue and it gave us a better understanding of, I think, where the staff were um, with questions around leave and, and using sick leave from so, well, extended maternities. Yes, like I, I agree with Ms. Bencourt. Very good conversation. Um, it'll come up again in my uh, monthly conversation, I'm sure, with Serge um, and Heather, which is next week, I believe, right before the vacation. Uh, you know, it's certainly we understand where they're coming from. We know that this is an issue that's important to teachers, and so we'll continue to engage in those conversations with folks as we move through the year, um, and certainly as we anticipate uh, in the successor agreement that will start next fall. It's going to be here. Well, we just signed one, so we get six months. Yeah. We're off that for a while, so. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chairman, just to let the committee know, um, that is the letter that you all had in your packet to the audit. Report. The auditors will be here in the January meeting to do the presentation. I just wanted you to have the packets earlier so you've had time to review it prior to the meeting. <coughs> okay. um, any other business? Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to um, have a motion please, to go under um, Chapter 30, Section 21 for the executive session. No executive session no. tonight. No executive session tonight. Okay, I take it back. You will not be adjourning. Thank you. I have to make a motion to adjourn.
Second, please. Uh, second. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye.